My name is Victor Furman. Some call me the Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now, and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Since the passing of my mother in January of 2020, my brother, sister, and I have had many wonderful signs and messages that her presence is with us. With so many friends having similar losses in the era of COVID-19, I shared the following in my aphorisms notes. Life in this dimension is finite. Our essential selves are infinite. As we mourn loss in the temporal, let us embrace the permanent and never forget that love is eternal. There are those who truly embrace this and in their grief are comforted by the presence of the essential selves of their loved ones. But what of those who do not feel this and those who doubt that this communication, this contact, is even possible? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Mike Anthony, was a skeptic until a series of events proved to him that love survives death. Mike Anthony has been a professional actor and a not-professional bartender. It was in the role of the latter that he was lucky enough to experience from an up-close perspective the ride that Hamilton, an American musical, took as it rocketed into Broadway history. His first book, Life at Hamilton, chronicles his extraordinary time there. Beyond his life in theater, Mike's journey took an unexpected turn when his dad passed, leading him down a remarkable path of discovery. He now spends a good portion of his time exploring evidence suggestive of the survival of consciousness beyond the demise of the physical body. A part of Mike's story is shared in the Netflix documentary series, Surviving Death. His website is MikeAnthony.com, and he joins me this week to share his story and his book, Love Dad, How My Father Died, Then Told Me He Didn't. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Mike Anthony. Welcome, Mike. Hi, Victor. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for joining and sharing your story, because with so many folks losing parents and loved ones during this crisis of COVID, it's really important that they have an understanding of that connection that really never ends. So please share with our listeners about your life and path prior to your dad's passing. Sure. Um, I had uh, grown up loving science and uh, in in high school had decided that I was going to be a a high school science teacher. I had an amazing high school science teacher and I thought I was going to be the next Mr. Sawyer. Uh, And then I went to college to undergrad uh, with that intention. Uh, But I also did theater uh, a lot as well. And I was minoring in theater. And then in the very last year of uh, college to my to my parents dismay who were helping me pay for that college, I called them and said, you know, I think I really, I think my heart is really in acting. Do you mind if I stick around for another year of college uh, and your hard-earned money to pay for that uh, to to, um, get my degree in acting? And my parents, being the amazing, unbelievably uh, supportive and loving people that they are, said, you know, whatever it's going to take to make you happy, we want to help you do that. So uh, in the end, I I graduated with a degree in uh, theater and acting, uh, and then I went and uh, got an MFA in in that, uh, and then moved to New York City uh, to become uh, an actor, uh, and then took a job as a bartender uh, on Broadway, which I thought would be a, a a job I'd have for a few weeks, you know, until my career took off into the stratosphere. Uh, and then 14 years later, I turned around <laughs> and I was still behind that bar. Uh, however, uh, I had you know, the most wonderful experiences uh, in that job. You know, I experienced things that I never could have imagined. And then when Hamilton came along, which uh, I worked for, uh, you know, that was a that was a real um, powerful experience. And, and I wrote a book about my experiences there. Um, and and then every and then uh, I had actually decided that I it was time to step away from bartending. And I was thinking about going back to school uh, to to maybe be a 
a science teacher. I was going to go and complete those uh, credits that I'd need. Um, and just when I was thinking about that, my dad, uh, who was 60 and he was a young 60, you know, he, he, in my family, we thought that if anyone was going to live to be a hundred, that it would be my father. Uh, he worked for FedEx. He was a FedEx delivery person. Uh, so he was very active. Um, and then he suddenly without any warning whatsoever, uh, died. And that, threw me and my family into an absolute tailspin. Um, it, I mean, uh, it's hard to, to uh, come up with the words for, for what this felt like. Um, you know, I, I'd, even though I'd, I'd always loved science, I, I had always felt like there was something more. You know, I, I had always felt that there was something more uh, that we couldn't understand and that maybe science wasn't capable of of getting at you know uh, maybe there are some things that our science just simply uh doesn't have access to um but when my dad passed <clears throat> any any uh faith i guess is the word any faith that i had that that might be true went out the window and i was uh completely devastated at the idea that my dad it, it, that it was as though he had never existed, that his all that he was, all of his love and his thoughts and his memories and his passion and dreams were just gone into the void as though they had never been here before and they will never be here again. Uh, uh, just that that thought um, was sent me into an absolute existential crisis. I so it wasn't just the depression of losing my dad. It then became a question of, well, what is the point of anything? If all we do is disappear into the ether, um, never to be heard from again, as though we'd never even been here, then what's the point of anything at all? And that's the place that I was in. Now, you were really close with your dad. And the week before his passing, you had your last meeting with him. And you talk about that in the book. Please share it with our listeners. Yeah, it was actually the day before he died. My dad, my dad, looking back on this, must have had a sense that something wasn't right, uh, though we had no idea he must have uh, even maybe at a deeper subconscious soul level that that he was um, his time with us was short, maybe because he really wanted to see me that week. Uh, I had Mondays off. That was my one day off a week. And it was also his one day off a week. And I, I, I was living in New York City at that time. And they lived in Connecticut. And I got home maybe every other week, typically on average. But I wasn't scheduled to come home that week. I had an audition, I think, for something. And uh, he said, you know, are you coming home tomorrow? And I said, no, I, I, I've got a thing this week, but I'll definitely be there next week. And he said, uh, oh, OK, you know, maybe I'll come down to see you then in New York. And I knew that was odd because my dad uh, driving into New York City was not the kind of thing he would <laughs> love to do on his one day off. You know, he was not a, a, a city uh, guy and the hustle and bustle of the city driving in it was was uh, not not a relaxing uh, thing for him. So I, I quickly, you know, said, no, oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll come home. You know, so I rearranged my plans or whatever and came home that following Monday, the next day. And we had this extraordinary day together. My whole family, um, you know, my family's odd in that my mom and my dad divorced when I was only about four, three or four. And um, however, they ended up staying f lifelong friends. And my mom considers him to this day, even though she's still married to the guy she married after my dad 38 years ago or whatever it is, uh, she, she considers my dad to be her, her soulmate um, in a sense. I mean, even though they did, did not work as a couple for whatever reason, uh, she feels like they have a deeper connection. So they stayed friends their whole life. So we had this whole day together, all of us together, including my stepfather uh, and with my, my niece and my nephew, my, my, my dad's grandkids who were the loves of his life. Um, and it was extraordinary. And then everybody else went to bed. Uh, and my dad and I were alone uh, watching the Monday night football game together. And he said, you know, the reason I wanted to talk to you today is because um, he, he had decided that he wanted to start putting his money into uh, my and my sister's name. His, his mother had um, – was suffering with Alzheimer's at that point, and all of the money she'd saved her whole life had gone to her care, and it was gone now. And he did not want his hard-earned money as a FedEx delivery driver uh, to, to, you know, he did not want that to happen to him. So he uh, wanted to start putting his money.
money into our names while he was alive. And I said, Dad, uh, first of all, I don't want any of your money. You know, if, if you ever passed away and I was left with your money, I would feel nothing but awful that you did not spend it. After all of the work you've done, I want you to spend that money and just enjoy your life. Um, and he said, you know, you guys are my life. Mm. And um, – and then I said, you know, Dad, you're you're going to be here for a long time. You know, you're you're not going anywhere. And at one point in the conversation, we were talking about his mom who had Alzheimer's, and I said, you know, I, I think for for someone like Graham, for my grandmother who was who was afraid of of the idea of death, um, something like Alzheimer's might be a blessing, as as hard as it is for everyone around her. Of course, it's awful, but for the person who's going through it. it Maybe it makes that transition not quite as scary because uh, she was certainly not as afraid anymore once she had gotten into the later stages, you know. Um, so and and then he said, "Well, I'm not afraid to die," and 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 it was odd because we weren't talking about him at that point; we were talking about his his grandmother. So now I have in my in my experience uh, the the fact that my dad, approximately thirty minutes before he died told me that he was not afraid to die. So I think that his uh, his his um, helping my family to get through his passing began even before he left his physical body. Uh, that's how it that's how it appears now. So he had a sense of knowing and then the next day you're back at work tending the bar and you get a phone call. What happened? Yeah, it was just the shock of my life. I was working at a, a show that Woody Allen was directing, uh, and, and Woody Allen was downstairs, uh, which is just an uh, you know apropos of nothing. It's just an odd point to the story that he happened to be there when my life shattered. Um, and I get this phone call as intermission is about to begin. It was a three-act play, and it had two intermissions. And the first intermission was about to happen, and I get a phone call. And my sister is um, alarmed. Her voice is very alarmed. And she says, is, did dad come back with you to New York today? And I was like, no, of course he's not. Why? What do you mean? And as it turned out, he had not shown up for work that day. And, and my dad, I, I mean, I think he literally never called in sick in his entire life. I, and I mean that literally. I don't think he ever missed a day of work. His worth ec ethic was just unbelievable. Um, and so obviously I knew something was wrong for him to not only not not – go into work, but to not even make a phone call, the only answer could be that he was dead uh, in my mind. So so then I, I, I do the intermission. I'm serving drinks and everything. And then uh, meanwhile, my, my brother-in-law is back in Connecticut driving to my dad's house, which is about five minutes from his house. And he gets there and he finds the police there. Uh, what happened was someone who works with my dad got very nervous when he didn't show up because this woman knew that my dad would never do that. So she actually took it upon herself to drive to his house and knock on his door and when he didn't come she called the police um and and sure enough uh when they found him he was on the floor uh he still had his keys in his hand so he had left me uh at my mom we were at my mom's house watching that football game together he drove you know for the five minutes to his house because we all lived very close to each other and then walked in the door and died uh so i get a phone call just before the second intermission and my sister is screaming She's she's wailing on the phone. And I say in the book, you know, the ter the word wailing I had read like in Greek tragedies before, but I never knew what it meant until I answered that phone mm. and heard my sister, uh, her soul shattering over the phone. And then my mom, I hear her screaming in the background and her screaming is getting louder and louder as she's running up to my sister. And my sister just says, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. And all I could say in that moment was, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. I just kept repeating that because in that moment, I, I was sure my mom and my sister were going to die too. I mean, that's how awful the screams were. I really thought I was going to lose them as well. And then intermission happened. So I'm suddenly, you know, on Broadway at intermission, you suddenly have 500 people at the bar. And that's what happened. And, and, and I was in shock. I now realize I was in shock because I start making drinks. You know, I, I say to my, my bar partner, uh, my, my dad's dead. And he said, what? And I was like, my, my dad. Uh, and then I start making drinks and I'm smiling and I'm like, you know, are you enjoying the show? You know, and I'm making like rum and Cokes for people. Um, and somehow I got through that intermission. Like it was an, any, 
any other normal intermission. Um, which was just my brain, I guess, uh, protecting itself in some f- way, and it, I, I was in shock. Um, and and so that was uh, that was the beginning of of a journey that was going to totally change my life. You write about seeing your dad's body in the casket for the first time. Can you describe what that felt like? Yeah, it was the most bizarre thing to walk into that room and see him there. It was, you know, I say in the book that it was just wrong. That's the only word I can come up with. It was just not him in that casket. And the scientific part of me is thinking, okay, my dad, that body is still the same body that it was yesterday. If you looked at it under a microscope and you looked at my body under a microscope, a a strong enough microscope, they would be exactly the same. The universe, the material universe is made up of nothing, as far as we know, but, of, but protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? And then the smaller constituent parts that make up those things. But ultimately, th- that's all that there is, according to materialistic science. So how could that be? <laughs> what was it that made the difference between whatever that that body was in that casket and who that person was the day before? Um th- Right then, it seemed clear to me that something – science must not be right about this. There's got to be something that makes a person alive that is more than just the beating of a heart because how could a heart no longer beating make that big of a difference? Uh, and yeah, it was it was, a, it was just – it was just a moment that made me realize um, – that there's a lot more to to understand. You describe a very poignant scene of laying on the floor in the same room where your father died mm. and looking at what he was seeing before he passed. What was that like? Yeah, I, we I could not um, get past his last moments. I I was um, continually cycling the thought that he had felt some sort of pain and was afraid and couldn't like get to a phone or whatever. And the idea of him being afraid and alone, even like right now, it's hard for me to, um, to think about this. Um, the idea of him being alone and afraid, I can't handle. Uh, so given the position of his body, he, he was on the ground and his knees were bent up. You know, it was almost as though someone would look if they had laid down, uh, put their hand behind their head to take a little nap on the floor for some reason. Uh, that's the impression his the positioning of his knees gave. But yeah, I laid down in that spot um, and tried to just imagine his last moment and and pray with everything I had or maybe just convince myself that he did feel no pain, that that the reason he was in this position where his knees were sort of gently bent uh, was because it was it was a gentle passing somehow. And if anyone deserved a gentle passing, you know, in my mind, if there is any justice in the universe, a man like my dad would deserve a gentle passing because this guy was like a, you know, I mean, everyone, most people think that their dads are, are, are wonderful, but my dad was truly not a normal guy. The, the amount of goodness in this man was just not a normal amount he had he he was a tremendously amazing guy so uh yeah i laid it was you know i I realized that this is strange but i i i focused so heavily on the position of his body and uh because i was trying to figure out what happened in his last moment in our next segment we're going to talk about your process of discovery about life after death but where did this leave you? You had your the father, the, the, the person who was really your guide in life, the one who gave you unconditional love, leaving you and your sister and your family. Where did that leave you? Uh, with a feeling of hopelessness, uh, really. It, you know, my dad would have been the guy that you would have needed in a situation like this. Uh, if there was anything wrong in life, he was the guy who made everything better. He was the guy who was there to say it's going to be okay. Um, and you believed it when my dad said it. So to lose not only my dad, but also the person who I would have needed to help me through that process, to help my family through that process, was an incredible blow. And it left us um, 
we, we really didn't know how to go on. You know, we, that's, that's what I can say. We really didn't know how we were going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. My guest is Mike Anthony. He's the author of the book, Love Dad, How My Father Died, then told me he didn't. Mike, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and this work. Yes, the book is available on Amazon.com uh, and BarnesandNoble.com and uh, MikeAnthony.com is my website, and that has uh, all of the information about what I'm what I'm doing. Absolutely. And I just want to say to our listeners, there's going to be, you'll find a, a couple of videos that Mike put out. He is an extremely uh, funny man, in addition yeah. to being serious in this work, very entertaining and, and, and really touches your heart in, in many different ways. We'll be back with more of Mike after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Om Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going On? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Look out, world, we're getting strong. The future's here and we belong. She can step, she can do more. Like build a rocket and watch it soar. Or clean the oceans and make the world a better place. Oh. She can step, so can you. Find a cure, invent something new. There's no challenge in the world that she can't face. She can step. Learn more at She Can STEM, a message brought to you by the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Mike Anthony. He's the author of the book, Love Dad, How My Father Died, Then Told Me He Didn't. So you were going through literally uh, an intense grieving experience, you and your family. And then what happened? And then uh, within days of my dad passing, my mom got a phone call from a cousin of mine, uh, a second cousin. And uh, she, she called me at work and her voice for the first time since my dad passed was totally different. Like the, the, the vibrancy was back in her voice. And so I knew something must have happened. And she was like, you're not going to believe this. I, I think I just got a sign from dad. And I said, what do you, what do you mean a sign? And she said, do you remember Chris, your cousin Chris? And I was like, Chris, uh, I, I, I think so. And, and she was like, yeah, Chris, you know, he married Tracy. Or, and I was like, oh, God, I, I, I think I remember a Tracy. So this is like a cousin that we barely see is the point. You know, like he's a he's married to my second cousin. The whole tiered cousin thing is very confusing to me. But it, 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 I don't know that I'd seen Chris in 20 years. Right. Or my mom. So for him to call my mom that night was very strange. And she's he said, so, you know, Liz, this is Chris. You're, you remember me? And she said, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, he's like, do you, do you know what I do? 
And she said, uh, n- no. <laughs> and I, I, I talked to Chris afterwards. Um, this was such an uncomfortable phone call for him to make because he had no idea. He hadn't talked to my mom in a long time. He didn't know what my mom's beliefs might be about life after death or anything of that nature. Uh, so for him to make this phone call took a lot. Um, and he said, well, I, I'm a ghost hunter on the weekends. And she said, Oh, okay. <laughs> and she, my mom had no idea what a ghost hunter was. Um, and, and my cousin at that time in his life, he tells me now he was still in the quote unquote paranormal closet because he had a big time uh, administrative job at a hospital. And he didn't think it would be good for, for his colleagues to know that what he did with his weekends was go to houses and try to contact uh, spirits but that's what he did and he you know he, he they did it with um, all of the various instrumentation uh you know the 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 the, the, the uh, audio recorders and the the ghost boxes with that make white noise and everything and he said so um one of the people on my team is a medium do you know what a medium is and my mom said yeah yeah i, I i've heard of mediumship and she said, okay, uh, Robert has contacted her and he really needs to get a message to you guys. And I tell the whole story about that phone call in the book. But the, the point was that apparently what it seemed is that my dad uh, died, came out of his body, took a look around and found the closest person anywhere in the vicinity that could possibly get a message to my family. And he found this woman who was connected to a second cousin's husband. And he said, okay, you. And he latched on to this woman and and said, you've got to get this message to my family that I'm okay. And he gave her the name Robert and that there was a fish fish restaurant connected to this family. And my sister owns a fish restaurant. So that's how Chris made the connection that it was our Robert. Um, so, so she, I'm, I'm, I'm at work behind that same bar where I had gotten the call the week before uh, or two weeks before that he had passed. And I said, Oh, this is wonderful. You know, hearing my mom's voice, um, alive again was fantastic. But of course my skeptical mind was racing at this point thinking, what, is there any money involved in this? Like, are they, are, are we going to pay this woman? Like I, 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 I needed more information. Um, but that's how the journey into this investigation got kicked off. Grounded in science, wanting to actually be a science teacher, what was your impression of mediumship before this time? The only experience I'd had of it before that was with John Edward and crossing over on television. And I thought it was interesting. You know, the reactions were so emotional from everyone. Um, but the... the um, it was television, so I was sure that there was a lot of editing involved. Uh, you know, I just I just couldn't know, but I was definitely interested in it. The the other part of me was thinking, well, if this was real, certainly science would have told us by now, right? If, if something as big as the survival beyond death is a real thing that people like this guy John Edward can apparently prove then certainly it would have been on the nightly news by now and I would have heard about it. So that's sort of what was in the back of my mind. And then um, my family and I actually went to see a medium years and years ago after my grandparents passed and it was not a uh, not a positive experience it, just in that I, I did not think that this woman was actually connecting uh, with anyone on the other side. And in fact, I left that meeting thinking, well, I, I think I could be a medium because um, because not not much happened at all. So so, yeah, my my um, where I was mentally with mediumship was that I thought it was an interesting notion from what I'd seen on crossing over. Um, but I needed a whole lot more uh, evidence to, to put any real weight into it. And how did you test that mediumship? So my sister, uh, contacted a woman named Angelina Diana, who's a medium in Connecticut. Uh, and she was having her come to our house to do a reading. And I said, okay, dad, I, you know, I was, I was standing in, in my dad's garage, um, totally alone. And my dad lived in a back lot in the woods in Connecticut, totally all, all by myself. And I said, dad, if, if this woman is the real deal, I need you to tell me a specific message tonight that I'm going to say right now. I need you to say this thing. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what else she says. I'm not going to believe it. I need you to say this. I want you to 
have her talk about my hair. Um, and I, and I said that because the whole week I'd been trying to come up with a, a code word for my dad and I, I hadn't come up with it. And I, as I stood in the garage that day, which was just about three hours before the uh, sitting, uh, uh, this memory came back to me when I was a, a little, my dad, uh, we'd go to see him on the weekends cause they, they were divorced. So my sister and I stayed with him on the weekends. He was living at his mom's house and didn't have a bedroom of his own. So we all stayed in the living room on the floor of my grandmother's house in sleeping bags and we loved it and my dad would uh, we were so excited to be with him on the weekends that it was hard for us to get to sleep so he would play with our hair to help us fall asleep so the poor guy had uh, two little kids on each side of him and and his hands must have been absolutely cramped because all night long we would say five more minutes dad five more minutes Mm -hmm. and he would play with our hair until we fell asleep so I I need you to mention my hair in some way so that night um, she comes and, and does the reading and I give the detailed reading in the book I go into all of the things she said because everything was really extraordinary it was much more than just this thing she said so much I was completely baffled halfway in I, w- I was thinking oh my gosh I think this is real I think this woman is really doing something that science hasn't told me about somehow um, and everyone was weeping you know if this woman was a charlatan if she was, uh, you know, a con artist, she had done a remarkable job and she was going to get a whole lot of work out of this because because we're all saying, oh, my gosh, this is the most extraordinary thing that's ever happened to us. You know, we're all going to go out and tell everyone we know about this. This woman's going to get, you know, years worth of business out of us. Um, and you'd think that'd be a good time to wrap up uh, and go home, you know, go home and, 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 and uh, you know, job well done. But instead, as she was wrapping up to leave, and again, I had been convinced, even though I hadn't gotten the code word, I'd been convinced by that point because of other very highly specific things she said that she could not have known that were not published anywhere on Facebook or anything like that. Uh, I thought she was the real deal. But as she was wrapping up to leave, she looks at me apropos of nothing. It's a self-contained moment. Uh, you know, she, when she gives some of her messages, she kind of pauses for a moment and looks up at the sky or down at the ground and kind of looks uh, sort of daydreamy. And she did that out of, uh, you know, in the middle of, of another conversation. And then she looked right at me and said, he wants me to talk about your hair. Mm. And I completely, I mean, I, I, I couldn't breathe. I mean, I literally couldn't breathe for a second. It, it knocked the wind out of me. Um and in in that one moment right there my life completely changed completely because i knew right then that there was much more to the universe than my college professors told me there is what would you say to those who say that your grief affected your ability to process this information yeah i mean I, that's a valid point right the the uh, what skeptics say is the skeptics who believe that they're all there is in the universe is material, right? Who scientific materialists, they believe that these people have to be cheating because that's the only explanation since life definitely in their minds, life definitely cannot survive the death of the, the brain, um, that these people must be cheating. So they say that the way they cheat is by, uh, doing something called cold reading, which is, you know, they're just basically very good at picking up on cues, uh, subtle cues that the person is giving off um, and and they prey on our grief because it's definitely true that when we're grieving and we are desperate to believe that this is a genuine phenomenon um, it could be easy to fool you and I was aware of that you know that's all that I can say is that going into this I was aware of that and I tried to um, uh, stay hyper aware of everything I was doing and saying and um, and of what Angelina was doing and saying for instance if she had been cold reading I would have imagined she'd been she'd be paying very close attention to our faces, our expressions, our reactions to the things that she said. And in fact, it was the opposite. A lot of times she would, like I said, she'd be sort of in this daydreamy state, looking up at the floor or the ceiling, not even at us. And she'd say something. And then, and then sometimes she'd say something that I thought was clearly wrong. Right. And, and from looking at my sister's expression and thinking, okay, 
if I was a medium and my sister made that face, I would think this is wrong. I'm not, I, I should not keep going down this particular path. But Angelina wouldn't give up. And then um, a couple of times something – then it made sense and Jen said, oh my gosh, yes, that's that's right, you know, something like that. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm aware of, of grief uh, being a, a lens um, that can cloud your judgment. But I took my my uh, investigations much further than just my own personal experience uh, and that was part of it. I needed to know – if I had somehow fooled myself a- after the euphoria wore off of that experience of her mentioning my hair, I, my brain still wouldn't let it go. And a year or so later, I called that woman back and I said, listen, I need to know that what you did is genuine. I have to know. Uh, I, I, I want to make a film, a documentary about this, and I want to film you doing what, whatever it is you do, but with people that I bring to you. So I will know without question there's no way you could have cheated. There's no way you could have looked up any information or hired detectives to follow people around or anything like that. And she said, sure, I'll do that. Right away, she said she would do that, which that alone was surprising. And uh, and that's what I started to do. I had her sit – at this point, I've had her sit with about 20 people. Um, <clears throat> in the book, I talk about 10 readings that I did with her. And those I'm emotionally – removed from somewhat you know it's not my dad that i'm hoping to hear from so i'm able to i'm able to watch this more objectively um and even in that process angelina continued to give the kind of evidence she gave to us that night in a situation where i knew without a doubt 100 percent she could not have been cheating uh, at least by looking information up about anybody there's no way she could have done that now, and the results stayed the same now not with her but with other mediums in your research you found something called the forer effect which is also known as the barnum effect what is that right. Yeah, the Forer effect is – there was a, a guy named uh, uh, Professor Forer who did an experiment with his uh, college students where he he had them fill out a questionnaire uh, and it was um, fill in the blank. So it was like maybe 10 sentences. You know, my favorite color is blank and they would fill in those answers. And he told them that based on those answers, he was going to gain uh, a psychic insight to who they were as human beings. You know. He was going to be able to use those few words to really uh, look deeply into their souls. And he then um, handed them a each a, uh, a, a paragraph or a, a couple of paragraphs about who they were as people. And they were blown away by his accuracy. They couldn't believe how he could have gleaned so much information from them just from these little um, one word answers they'd given. But what he had actually done was he didn't even look at their answers. He threw those into the garbage immediately, and he gave every single person the same uh, astrological uh, uh, reading that he'd taken out of a magazine that weekend. Mm. So every student got the same uh, horoscope, but they thought 4.25 out of 5 stars. Uh, so, so they very strongly – believed that it was specifically meant for them and that it was very, very accurate. Uh, and so that's what the four effect is. Our brain, it, it's very good at, at uh, because of millions of years of evolution, it's very good at, at, at picking up patterns. It, it looks for patterns and it can fill in information that might not actually be there uh, if it expects the information to be there. Um, and this was good for because if you were running away from a, a lion, you know, millions of years ago, uh, and you knew exactly what a lion looked like, um, your brain, if it saw a lion peering out from a bush, maybe wouldn't have to see the whole lion, it could just maybe pick up a bit of the nose and the eyes, and the brain would fill in the rest of the information very quickly to let you know to run. Right. That's the that's the evolutionary theory of uh, what's called patternicity. So the four effect says that our brain latches on to the things that it also personalizes the things that um, are said, even if they aren't meant for us. So if I say to you, um, Victor, I feel like, you know, there's something important about a radio in your life. Right now, that's a general statement. I could say that to so many people. And as soon as I say it, your brain starts to go to a particular thing about radios. Um, and after the experience is over, 
that's what you remember most, that I said the word radio, but you don't remember me saying the word radio necessarily. You remember your brain's attachment to whatever it grabbed onto. Um, is this making any sense? Uh, absolutely. And to take this one step further about skeptics, yeah, you had an experience with Pendulite of Penn and Teller. How did it make you feel? That was extreme. Yeah. Penn is an amazing um, magician, right? Penn, Penn, Penn and Teller are amazing magicians. And they do an act called the comic, uh, the uh, the um, co- psychic comedian. And they do some mentalism. Now, mentalism is this an amazing ability uh, that people who do it claim there's no paranormal aspect to this, whatever. Uh, but they can make you, they claim, think of numbers. They know what number you're thinking of, or they can put the thought into your brain somehow. And Penn does does this. And when I saw him do it, he happened to be doing it at a theater that I work for. Um, I was shattered because he did appear to be, you know, quote unquote, reading people's minds somehow. And Penn is an absolute uh, skeptic, right? With He believes there is literally no such thing as anything paranormal whatsoever. Anyone who claims a paranormal ability is a cheat and a liar and a terrible person. Like he really thinks that these people are evil, just preying on people who are grieving. Um, and so he starts off the bit by saying everything you're about to see is BS, based on their Showtime show BS, um, except he said the full word. Mm-hmm. And and then he does this bit, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, well, if he can do this, maybe that is what Angelina is doing somehow, even though that's hard for me to believe. I mean, before Penn has honed his skills for years and years and years. Angelina had a full-time job for years before she became a, a professional medium, so I, it was hard to see how she could have had the time to do all of that. But anyway, I'm thinking, well, maybe – Maybe that's what she's doing. So I walked out of the theater after having been on this high for such a long time now through the process of making the movie. Um, I walked out feeling despondent and I decided I was going to go back the next night um, just to uh, try to see if I could figure out how he was doing some of what he was doing. Um, And as he is saying the words BS, everything you're about to see is BS. I noticed this flicker up in the lights. And sure enough, it turned out to be this butterfly, this big butterfly. And we're going to pick up on that in the next segment. My guest is Mike Anthony. He's the author of Love Dad, How My Father Died, Then Told Me He Didn't. We'll be back with more of Mike after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Mike Anthony. He's the author of the book, Love Dad, How My Father Died and Then Told Me He Didn't. So we were just talking about in the last segment, you were trying to determine how Pendulite of Penn and Teller does his mentalism or his his, uh, apparent mind reading. And uh, all of a sudden, and you'd been despondent because you, he sort of took the wind out of your sails in terms of your experience. And then all of a sudden, something happened. What happened? Yeah. um, Up to this point, butterflies had become a sign between my dad and I. And I realized that, you know, lots of people see butterflies. I know the, 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 the rational part of my brain said to myself, you know, you're not suddenly seeing more butterflies. You're just noticing them now. However, I was seeing them at very... Uh, significant times and in significant ways. So it had already become this this thing between my dad and I, these butterflies. So I'm standing at the back of the theater. My heart is breaking as Penn is so vehemently declaiming that there is no such thing as anything paranormal or mediumship or anything like that. Um, and as he – literally as he is saying the words BS, he pauses between the B and the S, the words – for effect. And in that pause, I see this flutter in the lights and it's a butterfly. 
Mm. And, you know, lest I think it's it's my own breaking heart that's helping me by showing me this vision that isn't really there. Uh, there's this Twitter in the audience. You know, pe- people are uh, – there's a titter in the audience. People are like, you know, seeing this. And there's like a wave of sound as it flies over their heads. Um, and and I left. I, I needed to see no more. Uh, in, in Right then, it was like my dad was – rescuing me you know he, he, if there was ever a moment that i needed him again to to um show me that i'm not insane for believing what i had started to believe it was that moment and there was that butterfly and i've worked on broadway uh now for 14 years never before that had i seen a butterfly I, I, not only inside the theater in times square in new york city you don't see a whole lot of butterflies ever right i mean right. it's not like it's a there's a whole lot of greenery around it's a, it's a, it's pavement everywhere so to see it on the second floor of the marquee theater which is inside the marquee hotel you know you have to go up these escalators through three sets of doors i just couldn't believe it and then i even i went back the next night just to make sure that they don't use butterflies in the show somewhere you know i started thinking well maybe there's one later in the second act and it had escaped somehow but there are no butterflies used anywhere in the show so that butterfly somehow got into the theater and showed itself to me in the lights right above Penn's head, by the way, like 10 feet above Penn's head at the moment he's telling me there's no such thing as anything paranormal. Uh, And then for the icing on the cake of that story, a few days later, I was back at the Richard Rogers Theater where Hamilton is. And I'm telling my friend Marie, who's my who's my assistant about what happened. And I'm saying, I really feel like it was a sign for my dad. And I'm asking her, have you ever seen a butterfly in a Broadway theater? And she's saying no. And at the moment, I see out of the corner of my eye a butterfly. Oh. And sure enough, there was another butterfly. And I have pictures in the book of the look of absolute incredulity on people's faces because no one had seen a butterfly in a Broadway theater before. And most of the people that I work with, a lot of the ushers, they've grown up on Broadway. They've been working there since they were 15 or 16 years old. Uh, and it landed up in the chandelier. And then uh, not long after that, Penn happened to be standing under that chandelier. He came to see Hamilton and he was waiting for someone he was with that was in the bathroom and he's standing right beside my bar. And I thought about um, talking to him because I had wanted to have him in the documentary and I I spoke with him about that a little bit um, before I saw his mentalism act. Um, And uh, but when he was standing there that day, I just realized that for some people, there is a wall that is impenetrable. Um, for whatever reason, uh, you know, they're on their own path and everyone, of course, has to go through whatever it is they, they need to go through for whatever reasons that are beyond me. Um, and and in some cases, I feel like it's uh, your energy is better spent elsewhere. So I just kind of gave him uh, an inner quiet blessing mm-hmm. uh, and said nothing else to him about that as he stood under a chandelier where a few days before uh, uh, another butterfly had been sitting. Mm. A personal share. I mentioned this in the beginning of the introduction. My mother passed in January of 2020. Mm. And as an interfaith minister, I did all the family services and funerals. And I was eulogizing my mother. And uh, I have a sense of humor. And I said, many of you might not know this, but my mother was a Coke fiend. And everybody started looking. <laughs> And I said, not the white powder, the kind that comes in bottles. My mother loved Coca-Cola. She couldn't get enough of it. And we had cases and cases of it in the house when we were kids. In any event, after the funeral service, we all went out to a local restaurant. There were about 20 of us. And we, the server came, and we all put in our order for our beverages. And she came back, and she brought everyone their beverages. About five minutes later, she shows up, and she said, I'm not sure who ordered the Coke. And she holds up this glass. And we knew. We looked at each other, and we knew it was my mother letting oh us know gosh. she was with us. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, I love that. That's so great. Yeah, that's so great. So tell us about your involvement with the Netflix series Surviving Death and What Happened. Yeah, while I was making the documentary, uh, one of the people that was involved in my doc- documentary is a woman named Leslie Kane, who is a fantastic uh, investigative journalist. Uh, she she became well known for a book she wrote about UFOs uh, that was a bestseller, and now she's um, a journalist for the New York Times. And she's uh, her and uh, Ralph Blumenthal uh, broke the the story about the Pentagon's in, um, admission that we have uh, video evidence of uh, un- unidentified aerial phenomena. So she's, she's um, you know, very highly credentialed 
um, journalist and I trust her word. You know, she's a very smart woman and she wrote a book called Surviving Death. And it was uh, fat. It's a great book, and and most of it I had I had uh, known about. You know, I had been doing the research myself on most of the stuff in the book uh, until the end of the book, which uh, she covers a topic called physical mediumship, uh, which I had not heard much about at all. But anyway, um, I I got in touch with Leslie, uh, uh, and uh, which is a crazy story in itself, and I tell that story in the book as well. How we how we. Uh, became friends. Uh, but she was involved in, uh, the documentary when Netflix decided to make a six part series based on surviving death. Uh, and then she shared my story with Netflix and that's how I got involved in the Netflix series. And there was a special thing that happened that you added to the book at the end. You weren't going to include it in the book. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to share it because I think readers will be blown away when they read it, but you did have an ultimate confirmation of your dad's presence. I did. I did. And yes, you're right. I, I struggled mightily with whether or not to include the last chapter. Uh, the worry was that people would read the whole book um, and then get to the end and think, oh, well, this guy's just crazy. I just spent this whole book and he just turns out he's nuts. Uh, and and it's hard for me to believe myself, but um, it did happen exactly as I said it, it happened. Leslie was sitting with me when it happened multiple times. Leslie Kane again, who is, whose word is her livelihood. Um, and it was absolutely ultimate conver- confirmation that my science professors are not right. Penn Gillette is not right. And I cannot emphasize this enough, no matter how – studied a a skeptic might be no matter how smart they are and a lot of them are incredibly intelligent people incredibly intelligent people but no matter how brilliant if they tell you that there is no such thing as anything quote-unquote paranormal they are not right about that no matter how erudite their explanations are they're wrong uh and I've, i've seen it with my own eyes and and i uh you know that that's that's my only the reason I did end up including it in the book is because once you become aware that there is uh, that there is no ultimate authority on re- what reality is, it opens you up in all kinds of ways. Um, and and my life has blossomed since this experience because um, I'm I'm just I'm just open. To, to so many possibilities now, uh, now that I've seen what I've seen, you know, in some ways I feel sometimes like I'm walking around in a movie, you know, like most of the world, at least most of America anyway, has no idea that this reality is an absolute reality, uh, that what I describe in the, in the last chapter of the book. Um, they just don't know it. You know, we go, we live our lives and do what we do and we fight wars and do terrible things to each other. And meanwhile, there is this other aspect of the universe that is unbelievable and amazing and powerful and full of love and joy. And, um, and that's what I, I want. I, I hope that people will read my book and then start to do the investigation for themselves because that's what it – ultimately, that's what it takes. You've got to experience. You've got to seek it out. And that's the point that the this evidence is out there for those who look for it. Uh, and that's what I didn't realize before I had I had started this whole journey that the evidence is out there. But you have to go – you have to seek it out. Absolutely. What do you think your dad thinks of your book? Uh, I, I, lo- I love to think about that <laughs> because – You know, my dad was the most humble guy. Um, I write about in the book how I, you know, I I don't have a whole lot of pictures of him because he never wanted to be in front of the camera. He would always be the person behind the camera. Um, And when I see his face on the screen, I mean, I I was weeping uh, when when the Netflix show premiered because, you know, they he he's uh, he figures heavily in one of the episodes. Um, The idea of him being on millions of screens around the planet, uh, spreading this message of hope. um, I was you know, I was uh, I was weeping in a good way. Um, And I because, you know, I also write in the book about how, you know, I'm an actor sometimes and uh when i do a play now i literally believe my dad is 
still there watching me because he never missed a show in my life when he was in his physical body. He never missed a show. And now I honestly, truly, literally believe he still has never missed a show. Um, so I, I, I think that anything that would have brought any comfort to this world, my dad would have been so thrilled about. Uh, so I, I, I hope that he's just realizes <clears throat> it gets me emotional to think about this because it's all because of him. Mm. He did all of this. He without a body, you know, I, I picture him sweating because I needed so much evidence. The poor guy that like I, I just wouldn't leave him alone. Every time something would happen, I'd be like, oh, my God, that's amazing, Dad. But can, how about one more thing? <laughs> you know, so I just picture him sweating now, like wiping his brow saying, oh, my God, can I sit down now for a minute? Goodness gracious. Um, but I I. I I hope he knows, I know that he knows that his life um, that you might have considered to be small, quote unquote, in its reach while he was here in that he was a guy who was entirely devoted only to his family um, and never traveled very far. Um, But so great was his love that it crossed the divide of death. Uh, and is now being shared with people all around the world. Um, and um, and uh, I just hope that uh, he uh, – it brings me great joy to think about him reaching – his love uh, reaching other people. His amazing book is Love, Dad, How My Father Died, Then Told Me He Didn't. Mike Anthony, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you. Sure. The book is available on Amazon.com, and uh, my website is MikeAnthony.com, and uh, that's where all of the information about me is. Mike, thank you for joining us and sharing this wonderful message and a message of hope for those of us who are grieving right now over the loss of loved ones. Yes, there's so much hope out there. There's uh, and I and my heart goes out to everyone. I know so many are dealing with grief right now, especially given this past year. Uh, my heart and my love is with everyone, and I I do hope that uh, you can. Uh, I I pray for comfort for everyone. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the Voice Furman. Have a wonderful week. 